In 2028, SpaceX plans to do something NASA never attempted with their $150 billion space station. They're landing one starship on the moon's Shackleton crater rim and converting the rocket itself into a permanent base. No separate structures needed. Just repurpose the vehicle that got there. But here's the part that sounds crazy. They'll tip the entire 50-meter rocket onto its side to unlock 1,400 cubic meters of extra living space from the fuel tanks. How do you safely knock over a 100-ton spaceship without destroying it? The answer starts with understanding what makes this approach revolutionary. SpaceX looked at the International Space Station's $150 billion price tag and flipped the entire concept. Instead of building a separate base, they're using the rocket itself as the habitat. The lunar starship arrives painted white, stripped of heat shields and wings, because it's never coming back to Earth. It stays on the moon permanently, transforming from transport vehicle into working habitat. This isn't entirely new thinking. Back in the 1970s, NASA launched Skylab by repurposing a Saturn V rocket stage for a fraction of what a purpose-built station would cost. SpaceX is scaling that same logic to lunar proportions. Inside, Starship already offers 1,000 cubic meters of pressurized volume, larger than any crewed spacecraft flying today. But the real breakthrough comes after landing when those massive fuel tanks get converted into additional living quarters, adding another 1,400 cubic meters. That more than doubles the usable space. With launch costs targeting under $10 million per flight, this becomes the cheapest habitable volume per cubic meter in spaceflight history. The tipping process relies on the moon's gravity being just one-sixth of Earth's. Crews attach heavy-duty cables to Starship's nose cone. Then massive lunar rovers drive slowly away, pulling the ship down like a controlled lever. Before any of this happens, engineers fire rocket engines to compact the regolith underneath, creating a stable foundation that prevents sliding. There's also a winch anchor method where a giant electric winch bolts to something solid, maybe a boulder or another Starship's landing leg, then slowly reels in cable until the ship rests horizontally. Once horizontal, the real transformation begins. Astronauts strip out old rocket components and install a new interior floor running lengthwise through the hull, converting a hollow metal cylinder into a functional corridor. They add walls, lighting, plumbing, air circulation, and electrical systems. Eventually, you get living quarters, workstations, a galley, showers, gym equipment, all the essentials for long-duration stays. It's a lunar apartment with Earth visible through the windows. But this takes serious work. Expanding into those fuel tanks to access the full 1,400 cubic meters requires roughly 165 workdays, with about 60 days just modifying the tanks themselves. That's exhausting labor inside bulky spacesuits with limited tools and constant dust. This is exactly why robotic assistants, possibly Tesla's humanoid robots, could handle the heavy assembly work. Robots don't get tired, don't need life support, and can work through the lunar night. The final layout features one long single-level floor positioned about one-third up from the base, creating storage space underneath while maintaining an open ceiling to fight claustrophobia. Power generation changes everything about lunar operations. Shackleton Crater's rim offers near-constant sunlight, which is why SpaceX chose this location. Large solar arrays positioned on the rim capture low-angle sunlight, delivering about 1,361 watts per square meter. With no atmosphere blocking it, lunar panels generate 300 to 400 watts per square meter, roughly 20 to 25 percent more efficient than Earth-based installations. Unlike other lunar sites that experience 14-day nights, Shackleton's rim provides almost continuous illumination.
This means the base can run power-hungry equipment without interruption, supporting four to six crew members while transmitting real-time data back to Earth. For backup during rare shadow periods, SpaceX is exploring partnerships with companies developing orbital solar concentrators that could beam intensified sunlight to the surface, boosting output up to tenfold when needed. But the baseload solar is what makes long-term habitation feasible. Starship's volume works for short missions, but month-long stays need more room. This is where 3D printing from Lunar Regolith becomes critical. New modules, labs, and living quarters can be printed directly from moon dust and attached to the main habitat. The base grows over time, forming a hybrid structure combining repurposed spacecraft with locally manufactured additions. This approach tests the construction techniques humanity will need for permanent off-world settlements. Protection from space hazards requires covering the habitat with about 5 meters of lunar regolith. This blocks most cosmic radiation and absorbs micrometeorite impacts. Telescoping lunar cranes with clamshell buckets scoop regolith and deposit it over Starship's hull until the entire structure sits under a protective blanket. It's a natural bunker made from the moon itself. The timeline is accelerating fast. While Starship version 3 hasn't flown yet, speculation centers on Ship 44 as the first human landing system prototype. Back in August, S-44 got pulled from SpaceX's normal production sequence, right when SpaceX confirmed the HLS cabin entered fabrication. By early December, S-44 appeared without heat shields or flaps, suggesting it's not a standard flight vehicle. If S-39 flies on Flight 12 and S-40 on Flight 13, S-44 could participate in Flight 17 in late 2026, positioned between the orbital refueling demo in June 2026 and the uncrewed HLS landing in June 2027. SpaceX has already completed 49 key hardware testing milestones, showing they're ready for this challenge. Meanwhile, NASA continues struggling with Orion delays. After heat shield erosion during Artemis 1, Orion hit another issue when a thermal barrier blemish prevented the hatch from closing properly. A November 18th repair fixed it, but delays pushed the countdown demonstration to December. NASA maintains Artemis two stays on track for April 2026, though some insiders suggest February might be possible. This reveals something important about the current space landscape. NASA's engineering capability remains solid. Catching defects before flight shows safety protocols work as designed. The real constraint isn't technical, it's political. Inside NASA, many remain legally bound to continue developing SLS and Orion, regardless of Starship's progress. The moment Starship proves itself through repeated flights, the power balance shifts dramatically. What many miss is that Blue Origin's New Glenn serves as a political backup. Politicians rarely want single companies dominating critical sectors. Even if New Glenn can't match Starship's capability, it offers Congress a semi-reusable, heavy-lift alternative and political cover to transition away from SLS. This is likely why NASA reopened the Artemis III lander contract and brought Blue Origin back. It maintains multiple players in the game. Back in July 2019, Elon Musk told Time magazine that SpaceX could probably land Starship on the moon faster by just doing it rather than waiting for endless approval rounds. He said it may literally be easier to land Starship on the moon than convince NASA they can. From NASA's perspective, that skepticism made sense then. The old guard remembers Apollo's achievements built through government oversight. Then comes SpaceX, claiming it can achieve lunar landings at a fraction of traditional costs. But two years after that statement, SpaceX won NASA's human landing system contract, beating Blue Origin and Dynetics. The win came from scoring highest across all evaluation criteria, technical merit, cost, 
and management. SpaceX offered a fixed-price contract of just $2.9 billion, far cheaper than competitors. Starship's reusability, proven through Falcon's track record, made it both affordable and credible. NASA only had budget for one winner, so SpaceX's lower cost and proven execution won. Skepticism about Starship HLS still exists within parts of NASA and the space community. But while doubts continue, quiet progress inside Starbase tells a different story, one that's about to become impossible to ignore. The numbers tell the rest of the story. SpaceX's commercial revenue is projected to surpass NASA's entire annual budget as soon as next year. NASA will account for less than 5% of SpaceX's revenue, yet the relationship remains operationally crucial because SpaceX is currently the only option meeting NASA's safety standards for astronaut transport. Starlink drives most of that revenue growth, fueling rapid expansion while Starship development accelerates. But SpaceX's ambitions extend far beyond Internet satellites. Elon Musk's long-term plan to build a self-sustaining Mars city requires transporting millions of tons of cargo powered by a vast Starship fleet. That scale demands massive funding that won't come from government contracts. SpaceX is also reportedly exploring new satellite constellations dedicated to AI computing and power generation in orbit, potentially triggering another major fundraising round and pushing toward a long-anticipated IPO. This brings us back to that 2028 moon base. What started as a radical idea, tipping rockets onto their sides and living inside converted fuel tanks, now represents the most cost-effective path to permanent lunar presence. While NASA spent decades and $150, Billion on traditional approaches, SpaceX found a way to do it for under $3 billion by simply asking, what if the transport vehicle becomes the destination? That question might define how humanity expands beyond Earth. So, what do you think? Could Ship 44 really be the first lunar starship? Will this approach work, or are there challenges SpaceX hasn't fully addressed yet? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. If this breakdown helped you understand SpaceX's moon strategy, hit that like button and share this with anyone following the space race. And subscribe to Atlas Space because we're tracking every development as Starship moves from testing to actual lunar missions. The next two years will be critical. When China's rockets launch, white chunks rain down from their sides. Most observers assume it's just ice shedding off, exactly like Saturn V or SpaceX rockets do. But what if that assumption is dead wrong? Here's the reality. It's foam insulation, and in 2021, a single piece destroyed the Hyperola-1 rocket by striking its grid fin mid-flight. This is the same type of insulation that caused the Columbia disaster, killing seven astronauts. So why do Chinese rockets keep dropping this deadly debris when SpaceX has already solved the problem? Let's start with what most people get wrong. When you see white material falling off American rockets like Saturn V or Falcon 9, that's ice.